Good afternoon. My name is Michaela O'Brien. Welcome to the workshop, CAR T Cell Therapy, its role after transplant. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Matthew Lunning. Dr. Lunning is an associate professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology and medical director of the Clinical Research Center at the University of Nebraska. His research focuses on lymphoma and CAR T cell therapy. Dr. Lunning has served on several national committees on immunotherapy and lymphoma and is a member of the American Society for Clinical Oncology's Cancer Education Committees on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lunning. Thank you for that kind introduction and uh, welcome everybody this evening. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the time uh, to uh, give this talk. Uh, CAR T-cell therapy, its role after transplant. Here are my disclosures. The objectives that I'd like to cover today are um, multiple, but uh, to start off, I'd like to discuss how the immune system and CAR T-cells share a common theme. Discuss where CAR T-cell therapy plays a role in the treatment of patients with blood disorders discuss the evaluation process for candidacy for CAR T-cell therapy, discuss the CAR T-cell journey for both patients and their families before, during, and after the procedure, and discuss the potential toxicities and impact on quality of life, both in the short term as well as in the long term. So this cartoon here is uh, meant to kind of uh, sort out just how complex our immune system is. And many of you have heard that uh, transplants um, or have gone through transplants or have had family members who have went through uh, transplants, and you've heard a lot of reference back to the stem cell. So it's the this, this, this stem cell that we often harvest prior to undergoing an autologous stem cell transplant, um, or it can be uh, certain areas or parts of the immune system that we're collecting, including stem cells. Uh, as part of an allogeneic stem cell transplant. So when I speak to auto transplant, I'm talking about uh, bone marrow or stem cells from the uh, patient who then they're reinfused versus an allo transplant, uh, which is uh, cells or stem cells taken from a donor that is matched to the best uh, possible uh, way to the donor. You can see here those stem cells then become uh, committed progenitors, and they may become parts of your myeloid system. So you've heard about neutrophils, uh, red blood cells, and platelets, which make up our, uh, our myeloid mature cells. So platelets stop um, um, clotting uh, if a patient were to bleed. Uh, red blood cells carry oxygen throughout the body, to, uh, and white blood cells are infection-fighting cells, or parts of our infection-fighting cells, typically uh, neutrophils, uh, basophils, eosinophils, uh, from that standpoint. On the top here, uh, you see um, the lymphoid progenitor, which can evolve into either uh, B cells, which may mature over time uh, in circulation as well as in lymph nodes. And then the oldest B cell is a plasma cell. And many of you have heard of plasma cells because those are the bad guys in the realm of multiple myeloma. Um, we see here at the top is, is T lymphocytes, um, and this is a part of uh, of the immune system, and they're very much like the general on the uh, of the immune system, where there may be very few of them, but they are helping signal to the, the rest of the immune system when an evader, whether or not that's a bacteria or a virus, um, enters the uh, enters the body to fight it off. But it also can play an important part uh, in fighting off cancer. So how does T cells uh, fight cancer? Here's another schematic of uh, seeing um, the tumor uh, there at the bottom. And if you follow the step wise, you can see that the tumor will often outgrow its blood supply and you will get autonecrosis of the tumor, which will release cancer cell antigens. Those cancer cell antigens are presented to a part of the immune system called dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells as highlighted by those red dots on the arms of the antigen-presenting cell. These antigen-presenting cells interact with uh, T cells and, and, and prime and activate those T cells. They then traffic uh, back potentially to the lymph node 
um, and create uh, cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes. Uh, for, through further signaling, those T cells then infiltrate into the tumor. They recognize those cancer cells by engaging uh, the cell surface of those cancer cells and work to kill a cancer cell through uh, a process of uh, similar to boring holes or uh, de degrading the cell uh, of the, or eating it um, uh, via different mechanisms. And so T cells are, can be incredibly important uh, in the fight against cancer. We knew this for a long time that T cells uh, can uh, um, interact and control uh, cancer. And one of the processes that, uh, as we further learned about T cell biology, is we uh, learned over time that there was uh, the T cells engaging a receptor on a cancer cell. Um, and that first signal of engagement may uh, lead to T cell energy, or the T cell just doesn't respond. And over time, we learned that actually the T cell needed two signals in order to activate uh, effectively to kill off another cell. So really, T cell biology requires a signal one of T cell engagement and a second signal, uh, more of a regulator uh, signal to further activate the T cell. We use this uh, understanding then uh, to take uh, T cells and re-engineer them into CAR T cells. And you can see here the Model T CAR uh, on the far left with our first generation CAR, which incorporated an anti-tumor associated antigen, so a small arm on the outside of the of T cell surface. And we're able to uh, regenerate just that signal one process called the CD3 zeta or the FCR gamma receptor. So this was just that first signal one. And really this first generation CAR T cell didn't really work very well. Um, at best, it could keep uh, a cancer in a petri dish under control for a certain period of time. That led to uh, further understanding of the of how the T cell interplay between signal one and signal two, and what, you, what led to the second generation CARs, where you have an anti-tumor associated antigen. So that can be any uh, a, a cancer antigen that's basically a flag that's flown on the outside of the cancer cell. But here we understood that we needed to incorporate signal two, and that signal two uh, would subsequently activate uh, uh, the T cells and allow them to further divide as well as uh, kill the cancer. You can see here that there were uh, have been two um, uh, signal two co-stimulatory molecules incorporated into a CAR T cell product, namely CD28 and 41BB. So these are the signal two. And the signal one is hanging out at the end there. And so with this signal one and signal two came about a new generation of CAR T cells called the second generation CAR T cells, which really uh, has shown significant amount of efficacy in uh, blood cancers um, depending upon the anti-tumor associated antigen. And we'll go through what those antigens are. Beyond the scope of this talk is, is further generation of CAR T cells where you're creating different um, certain loops and expanding the capabilities of, of these CAR T cells. And those are in the third generation uh, and beyond CAR T cells. But for the, say, uh, for the discussion today, we'll be talking about uh, CAR T cells that live in the second generation. So that's some really complex biology that I tried to uh, discuss uh, on this uh, simplified slide. But to simplify it even further, how do you discuss uh, with patients and patients' families, something incredibly complex, uh, um, and get get it to a level that potentially they could understand what's exactly uh, going to happen, or near exactly what's going to happen in their body. Um, so I have often used the uh, yellow corn to multicolored corn analogy uh, when discussing um, CAR T cell therapy with my patients, just based upon you know the 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 location or the geography that I live in. Uh, we uh, do serve some farmers or, or families who know farmers, and so corn and soybeans is not too far uh, from anybody's mind in, in Nebraska. Um, so how do I speak to this? So I use the uh, yellow corn analogy that think about all those kernels of yellow corn. Each individual kernel is a T cell. And what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, that ear of corn, which harbors hundreds if not thousands of kernels of T cells, and we're going to send it off to a company that takes that, those kernels of corn and re-engineers them to put CAR T cells on top 
of that ear of corn and then send it back. And when it gets sent back, it is multicolored corn. So each individual color may represent just the density of CAR T cell receptors on that individual kernel or T cell that we then give back uh, to that person. So no longer is it all yellow corn, but is multicolored corn. So there may be some yellow corns that didn't take, but there may be some black uh, um, uh, kernels that just have a significant amount of, of CAR T cell receptors available to engage that cancer cell that we inject back into the person's body. I often use then the popcorn analogy is, is what often happens when that kernel of corn uh, meets that cancer cell and it causes cell death. And that popcorn, if you've ever opened uh, microwave popcorn, uh, you want to keep it away from your face because steam will come out. Well, that energy uh, that comes out after that kernel has popped or that CAR T cell has popped that cancer cell can lead to uh, um, the toxicities that we attribute uh, to uh, CAR T cell therapy, which I'm going to speak to later on in this talk. So where does CAR T cell currently fit uh, in hematologic uh, malignancies? So we're going to go through on, on one simple slide here, four different CAR T cells uh, um, that are now FDA approved and their different uh, um, indications. So as you can see here, axicaptogene cytolelucil, otherwise known as Yescarta, is approved for the management of relapsed refractory large B cell lymphoma. It is also recently approved for mantle cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. So when I talk about a tu tumor-associated antigen or that flag that, it, that these CAR T cells attack, they're attacking the CD19 antigen on the tumor cell surface. Now, CD19 is expressed broadly uh, across normal B cells too. And so uh, with engagement of CD19 to CAR T cells, CAR T cells don't know if they're attacking a lymphoma cell or a normal B cell. And so it can deplete both good cells while it depletes the cancer cells itself. The same thing can happen with uh, T-cygen uh, uh, leclusal, otherwise known as Camraya. Uh, this is also approved in large B relapse refractory uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma but it is also approved in relapsed or refractory ALL um, up to individuals by age of 25, so in second relapse or later. This also engages CD19 as its target. The most recent CAR T cell that has uh, been approved by the FDA is uh, lysocaptogene cytolucil or Brianzi. This is currently approved just for diffuse large B cell lymphoma and continues uh, uh, the, the theme of targeting CD19. Most recently, and the, uh, the first approval in multiple myeloma was IDACEL or a BECMA. And so this uh, targets a different target because this targets a plasma cell disorder. And so this targets a BCMA or B cell maturation uh, antigen. And in myeloma, you can see here the indication is after four prior lines of therapy, and you have specific drugs um, that the patient uh, must have had exposure to before they can become available to receive this CAR T cell therapy. So what about the journey to CAR T cell? Well, I think it really starts with consultation. Uh, with a CAR T cell therapist, which may be an individual who sees only lymphoma or only sees myeloma, or it may be an individual who does auto transplants and allotransplants and CAR T cell therapy. So each institution is unique in who does uh, uh, cellular therapy or CAR T cell therapy, depending upon the location where you're being referred to. Um, what may, may occur is a consultation may, uh, with the individual may differ depending upon the disease type that, you, that the individual has, whether or not it's large B cell lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, ALL, follicular lymphoma, or multiple myeloma. At the time of the consultation, the, uh, uh, the physician uh, or their team will look at what prior therapies uh, the individual has had uh, before considering CAR T cell, because there may be a situation where um, they have not received enough lines of therapy uh, for it to be appropriate to uh, undergo commercial CAR T cell therapy. However, also at that time, clinical trials with related to CAR T cell therapy and other clinical trials 
uh, may be discussed. One of the other caveats is, uh, that we uh, may look at is CAR T cell can be a very intensive therapy. Just like uh, transplant is a in very intensive therapy, uh, CAR T cells uh, uh, therapy can be very intensive and can come with some significant toxicity. And so we will see what the tolerance of prior therapies have been. What was the, and, and also what was the intensity of the prior therapies? Did, they, did an individual get full doses of chemotherapy? Was there dose reductions that were required? Was therapy stopped uh, early because of, of unforeseen complications or toxicities? Also, has the individual undergone a transplant? And that transplant can include autologous transplant, again, transplants from um, the, uh, the patient's uh, bone marrow or stem cells, or an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And if an allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, has occurred, what have been the complications, if any, that have occurred post-transplant, whether or not it be infections, graft or graft versus host disease, and what is the pace of, of the relapse post an allo transplant? And that kind of leads to lastly talking about the disease status. Is this a person that has had a relapse of their disease? And how long was the remission uh, duration of remission? Um, and what is also the pace of, of the relapse? So uh, is this a relapse that has been occurring or been evident uh, over months or weeks, or is this tumor growing uh, by the day? Other statuses are if a patient is refractory or has uh, previously received a therapy that now the, uh, is growing through and these symptoms, uh, patient can be having symptoms in this, in this condition because not only are they having the toxicity potentially from the treatment, but they may be having toxicity from the disease concurrently. I would say the most concerning disease status to get a individual to CAR T cell are those individuals who I call never in remission. So these are people uh, who have aggressive, uh, who have um, often have aggressive biology, whether or not it's diffuse large B cell lymphoma, ALL. Uh, um, rare, uh, uh, more rarely, people with follicular lymphoma or mantle cell lymphoma, but can occur, where they've received multiple lines of therapy and they've never achieved uh, a remission. So their their lymphoma grew or was primary progressive or refractory uh, to subsequent line, uh, or two lines of therapy, whether or not they be one, two, or three lines of therapy, whether or not that's been to your kind of classical chemotherapy or your other tar more targeted oral therapies uh, or immuno, uh, immunotherapies. So what workup is done uh, during this time? Uh, so we will assess uh, the disease burden. This may be done purely by physical exam, but often imaging uh, via CAT scan or PET-CT, depending upon the appropriate use of imaging, may help discern um, what is the disease burden and what is the pace and whether or not that disease burden is uh, impending or uh, about to uh, cause um, difficulty with organ function. So is there a mass next to the kidney, a mass next to the liver, uh, um, airway, so on and so forth. We will also commonly do cardiac function, most commonly with an echocardiogram uh, to look at the strength of the function of the heart. We often will also do infectious disease workup to include, but not limited to HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Other laboratory assessments that we may consider is uh, 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 doing a complete blood count or a CBC. This can be helpful in establishing what the bone marrow reserve is, as many people have undergone multiple lines of therapy before coming to CAR T cell. And we also have to think about whether or not there's a second uh, potential uh, uh, cancer in the bone marrow called myelodysplastic syndrome which is where the bone marrow uh, uh, myeloid cells just don't, um, uh, aren't produced appropriately uh, and can lead to a, uh, which is a cancer and can lead to other acute leukemias over time. You also will look at hepatic reserve. So people will have, uh, may have received, received chemotherapies, which may, be, may have caused some toxicity to the liver. And you can manage, uh, monitor those by liver function tests as well as bilirubin. We'll also, also uh, often uh, draw blood to look at the creatinine, which can give a, an idea of our the renal reserve, um, and that's often in the creatinine clearance. And this is uh, something that is dependent not only on gender, but also on age and weight. 
sometimes if the creatinine clearance uh, is low enough and a patient is going towards CAR T-cell therapy, the lymphodepleting chemotherapy dosing may need to be altered. And lastly is looking at pulmonary reserve, and this is often done, at least in the clinical trial setting and often in the clinical commercial setting, looking at pulse oximetry. So just putting uh, that uh, pulse oximeter on your finger and um, uh, um, checking the level of oxygenation of, uh, of the body. So what's next after um, you, uh, your care team, and your physician or your CAR T-cell therapy team uh, decide that they'd like to go towards uh, uh, treatment. I call this period of time the brain to vein time. So when you and your physician want to go towards CAR T cell, and what happens uh, uh, before the CAR T cells are infused. And so this is a period of time which I think is um, currently one of the most crucial periods of time in CAR T cell therapy because it, you know you want to do CAR T cell, but there's a delay or a gap in time. Uh, to get to CAR T cell therapy. And that goes beyond the manufacturing of the CAR T cell itself, which can take um, um, days to weeks in order to manufacture. And so what are some of the uh, aspects of the brain to vein time that I think about and I discuss with my patients? It is uh, what is their insurance? Is it public versus uh, a private? And so public insurance meaning Medicare, Medicaid, private meaning your third party, uh, third party payers. Um, often patients with Medicare uh, can get to apheresis for CAR T cells uh, potentially uh, quicker than private uh, patients with private insurance. And this may affect what you would do in this pre-apheresis time frame. Uh, then is a, often a prior authorization where it's determined by the, uh, whether or not this is an on-label or an appropriate time uh, to do CAR T cell. After prior authorization is uh, is in place, uh, then uh, predetermination and, and single case agreements may be uh, um, completed if necessary. And single case agreements are about uh, negotiations about the payment for the product. So these products uh, are uh, do have a dollar sign uh, to them, and they also discuss payment for the care post infusion of the CAR T cell. So why do I? Uh, discuss this because this this uh, period of time can take uh, weeks uh, in order to uh, take place, and this is before you're taking out the T cells and sending them off to be uh, um, manufactured. So during this time, you have to think about the the pre apheresis treatment and what's the disease burden, what's the disease velocity, or or how is the disease changing over time, and really you have to anticipate the time. Uh, to T cell removal or, or apheresis because you may need to treat them uh, during this time. And what you and really what you're trying to treat them with is what I would call a disease stabilizing agent, but something that is not going to uh, or or you think is going to impact on their performance status. So keeping their performance status stable, but yet uh, at least impacting their disease to stabilize it. Now jumping into the vein to vein time. So this is. Uh, vein to vein time is after you pull the T cells out. So we often do this by, uh, similar to a collection for an autologous uh, stem cell transplant on a very on the very similar machine, uh, where we do uh, apheresis and then send them away for manufacturing until they're reinserted. Uh, and so, what are you doing during the post apheresis phase? Well, you're monitoring for fitness. You may have given chemotherapy in the pre apheresis time frame, but then you're uh, monitoring uh, uh, to see if you need to give more of that chemotherapy post apheresis. You're also monitoring for infections. You're, uh, you're, you may be considering even further bridging therapy uh, in the vein to vein time. And often we use steroids, um, uh, our bolus or pulse steroids, to help control the disease if it's a, a distance from the infusion. We may use uh, radiation to problem locations of bulk or threatening uh, locations to the organs. Um, uh, we may also use low-dose chemotherapy, again, if there's an appropriate distance uh, from um, the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So again, kind of looking at the timelines, it's apheresis, it's transported, it's sent to the manufacturing facility. Um, you can see there then, it, once it's manufactured, uh, it goes through a quality assurance uh, process to make sure the, the CAR T cells are, are in specification um, allowed for release by the by the FDA, 
It is then released. We often get a phone call saying that they're ready uh, to, for transport and they'll arrive on a specific day. Once they come on site, then you will start lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Lymphodepleting chemotherapy most commonly is with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. This is the most common uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy. The doses may differ depending upon the CAR T cell construct that is chosen uh, to be used. It is often three days of treatment and then at least two days of rest before infusion of the CAR T cell. There are some uh, CAR T cells, namely tetogen reclusal, which has used bendamustine given over two days uh, of treatment as part of lymphodepleting chemotherapy, as well as uh, tetogen reclusal is the only CAR T cell that has data looking at if you were not to use lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So the infusion is, uh, is often done in the patient's room or in the infusion center if being administered as an outpatient. It usually lasts for minutes, uh, but again, depends upon the product. Um, some products are in a single bag or may come in multiple bags. And some products may come in vials, uh, um, like Lysacel, which is a two-dose vial of CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. What does it feel like? Well, the infusion should be painless. Often people have pick lines or, cent or central lines in place. There can be an odor, which is from the DMSO. You may have heard about that odor if you had a prior autologous transplant. And that odor is often felt by the, uh, smelt by the family, but not necessarily by the patient, which is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. So to kind of wrap up uh, my talk, I'm going to speak to a little bit of the uh, uh, toxicities of CAR T cell, then we'll open it up for questions. So what can I say about CAR T cells in general is that the management of the toxicity, I really think that experience matters because there is a broad spectrum uh, to the toxicity profile of CAR T cells and really the management of the toxicity of cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity uh, has had quite the pendulum uh, shift over time as we've gotten more experience uh, with CAR T cell therapies and more experience with the treatments for CAR T cell therapies. So I'll speak to two uh, major uh, toxicities, the first being cytokine release syndrome. And as you can see here, uh, often it's pathognomonic or the first feature of CRS is fever, but can be uh, um, uh, concurrent with fatigue, nausea and vomiting. And as the grades increase, patients may have low blood pressure, low levels of oxygenation of the blood, and may lead in, in severe cases of to organ dysfunction. Um, often we're treating early grade um, CRS with a drug called tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor monoclonal antibody. And so different constructs may have different uh, treatment paradigms uh, and different treatment thresholds depending upon the grade of CRS. The next is I, the management of ICANs, or some people call it neurotoxicity. ICAN stands for Immune Effector Cell Associated Neurotoxicity Syndrome, or neurotox. I uh, um, call it my, uh, the shake of a hand when I'm seeing a CAR T cell patient kind of in their plus days um, in the pre-pandemic and even in the post-pandemic phase when I'm, I'm checking their neurologic function. I shake their hand and I hold their hand out to see if there's any evidence of tremor. Um, tremor, I, in my opinion, can be one of the earliest signs of, of co uh, coming uh, neurotoxicity. Also, you can see uh, agitation, word finding difficulties, weakness, and as it progresses to higher grades, you can see people have comas, seizures, and uh, also uh, may, uh, in the severe cases, have brain uh, swelling. This is often treated with systemic steroids and not necessarily treated with tocilizumab unless there is concurrent CRS. So what about post-infusion monitoring? So days 1 to 14, you're monitoring for CRS and ICANs. You have to have the ability of two doses of tocilizumab per CAR T-cell patient. So if you have five CAR T-cell patients in your hospital, you have to have at least 10 doses of tocilizumab available. Steroids commonly are, are dexamethasone that can be used. Um, and the dose depends upon the severity of the ICANs, but it may go to higher doses of uh, dexamethasone as well as methylprednisolone. Infections are uh, um, 
are a, a can be an issue, and so we do use prophylactic medications in the short term, including prophylactic antibiotics and antifungals. But in the long term, we concurrently use antivirals and anti-PJP medicines. Red cell transfusions can be uh, common given the previous treatment, as well as uh, um, these lymphodepleting chemotherapies uh, that were, were seen. And so it's not uncommon that patients early post-CAR T cell require red blood cell transfusion and platelet transfusions. We also work very hard with the replacement of electrolytes, uh, looking at things like potassium, uh, magnesium, as well as phosphorus uh, um, in the replacement uh, um, during times, during these times, and then IV fluids based upon whether or not the patient um, is eating and drinking uh, well. Kind of in the days 15 to 20, what I call the post-discharge, often um, depending upon the degree of, of uh, complications from the CAR T cell, patients may be out of the hospital at this, uh, at this point. Um, they're being, uh, um, remaining close in close proximity of the CAR T cell center. They have a 24-7 caregiver, and we're monitoring for recurrence or emergence, uh, less, uh, less commonly of CRS and ICANN. And you may be seeing your, uh, your um, post-CAR T cell team multiple times per week. You should be uh, often are having less uh, red blood cell transfusions. And this concept I call the double dip, where, as you can see, early count recovery uh, from the lymphodepleting chemotherapy, but you may see a subsequent drop in, uh, um, in the ANs, uh, the absolute neutrophil count, and people can require sporadic use of growth factor for neutropenia. This can potentially be more common if you experience uh, CRS or neurotoxicity during your CAR T cell therapy. And days 29 and beyond um, are when you're returning home. Um, often, if, you can, if you're traveling a distance and referred by your local oncologist, there will be a discussion uh, with the CAR T cell oncologist and the local oncologist, letting them know how the CAR T cell went, um, what are some special things that you need to, uh, to consider, and medicines that should be continued. Cytopenias may persist, but transfusions are hopefully less frequent in this time frame, as well as sporadic uh, um, neutropenia may, may uh, recur, requiring growth factor use, and slowly patients are returning uh, to work. We again are monitoring for recurrent infections because as I alluded to, with the CD19 CAR T cells and uh, potentially with BCMA CAR T cells, um, you can have B cell aplasia and that leads to low immunoglobulins and people may require um, um, IVIG or IV immunoglobulin use if recurrent uh, infections are seen and you have low IgG counts. Um, at Nebraska, we do our initial response evaluation around day 100. Um, we may do it earlier if there's potential concern for progression. And with each of these products, there's no driving uh, for eight weeks. This includes heavy machinery like combines. Uh, um, and what my recommendation is, is at that eight-week time point when you're ready to drive, return to the side streets or the rural, rural, rural roads first before hopping on things like the interstate or highways and just get comfortable behind the wheel again uh, because you're in a new um, a post car t cell environment. And this is my last slide before I uh, will take uh, uh, and have time for questions here. So in summary, use of CAR T-cell has been eff effective in difficult to treat situations with the prospect of prolonged disease-free survival. So that really sums up um, the majority of our CAR T-cell experience, despite uh, no head-to-head -head comparison of any CAR T-cell product. Um, and there has been, just alluding to, there's no head-to-head -head trial for large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, to determine the safest or most effective CAR T cell. And so it often is an individual decision with the CAR T cell team on what CAR, CAR T construct to move forward with or whether to move forward with CAR T cell versus other available therapies um, at that time. CAR T access uh, may be limited uh, by the brain to vein time. And so this can be often a frustrating time point for your uh, uh, CAR T cell team as well as uh, the care team um, as they're, you're waiting uh, to uh, apheresis and, and some of the things like treatment uh, that may need to occur during this time. I think really uh, um, because of the brain to vein time, half the battle is getting uh, to CAR T cell. We're dealing with um, often uh, very refractory situations and diseases that are growing very quickly and threatening to take people's lives. And so um, trying to 
control the disease uh, while getting uh, uh, getting to CAR T cell uh, can be difficult. And I will say that the toxicity management has significantly improved, and we've learned a lot over the years of clinical uh, within clinical trials and some of the different iterations of clinical trials to help us under, better understand how to treat uh, toxicity uh, and lessen that toxicity without potentially affecting efficacy uh, in uh, or how well the CAR T cell works um, in these lymphomas and leukemias and my, myelomas. And with that, I will end, and uh, I think we have uh, time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Lunning, for this excellent presentation. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Our first question is, if a patient has a CAR-T treatment and does not respond or relapses afterwards, would they be eligible for a different CAR-T or perhaps a clinical trial? Yes, you may be eligible for uh, a clinical trial or a different CAR T cell if at that time point um, it, it engages a different antigen. I think there have, been, there have been data of using the same construct where a patient initially um, is treated with a, let's say, a CV19 CAR T cell. That patient has a response and some, dur and some durability, and then the disease comes back that they have been retreated and have responded with uh, a second infusion of the same CAR T cell. There may be examples of using a different construct. Uh, in general, let's say you got a, an experimental CAR T cell first and then receive a commercial CAR T cell second. That is a possibility. I think um, I didn't go into, uh, because it's beyond the scope of this, uh, of this talk, but uh, you're alluding to there are some other CAR T cells that just don't hit one antigen, but they hit more than one antigen. So there are CAR T cells that are hitting CD19 as well as CD20 or CD19 as well as CD22. And so trying to reduce the escape mechanisms by the cancer kind of um, stops flying that CD19 flag or it was never flying it and we just didn't know it. And so hitting two different targets um, at the same time. So yes, that is uh, a possibility. And those, those CD1920, 1922 CAR T cells are still in the clinical trial realm I've often encouraged, um, you know, uh, uh, makers of CAR T cells uh, to not exclude people who have prior, uh, uh, prior exposure to CD19 uh, CAR T cells or CD19 engaging medications that are now uh, approved on the market. Uh, drugs like tafacitumab, you know, is a monoclonal antibody against CD19 um, that is that can, you know, is out in commercial use. Great, thank you. Next question, is a CAR-T therapy a less invasive treatment than transplant? Oh, um, well, that's, that's a tough one to answer because I've had people, you know, uh, people can die due to a transplant and people can die due to a CAR-T cell. So I think that they um, both have the, you know, potential for, uh, for significant toxicities. Um, Often the toxicities are different. We don't commonly see, you know, we can see engraftment syndromes um, with uh, fevers and uh, people can have difficulty breathing post, uh, as they're engrafting post auto or allo uh, transplant. Um, so I, it's hard to say that, that, that uh, one is, um, has, you know, more consequences. I think um, we had a longer period of time where we've understood, you know, autologous and allogeneic stem cell transplants versus CAR T cell, but they're all each unique. And I wouldn't say, um, you know, that, uh, um, you know, each has the potential to have their severe toxicities. So I wouldn't say one is, you know, less intense than the other uh, from that standpoint. Now, that being said, there may be patients who we would consider not doing a transplant in or what do we consider transplant ineligible that may still be able to go towards a CAR T cell uh, therapy. But really, in that transplant ineligible population, you really have to look to what was making them not transplant or what made them not a transplant candidate. And most commonly, uh, I think it is, is their disease not being amenable to getting a transplant, meaning that not being under good enough control to go towards an autologous or an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And remember, that can be the difference because we don't do consolidated CAR T cells, or meaning that you don't do a CAR T cell in a person who has um, often no evidence of disease, 
um, we are doing CAR T cells in patients who have evidence of disease, active disease and progressing disease. So it can be different scenarios. Okay, this question kind of piggybacks on that question. Can an allo transplant patient later receive the CAR T cells from the allo donor? And how does CAR T therapy compare to an allo donor lymphocyte therapy? Sure. Um, so that's a good question. So if a, if an, a person who's had an allo transplant has full donor chimerism, meaning that all their T cells um, are, are donor, and if that individual goes to a CAR T cell therapy, those by nature would be an allo CAR. There are examples of uh, in the clinical trial realm where, where we're doing allo CARs also, which it may not be the donor from the person who had an, al an allogeneic stem cell transplant, CAR T cells, but it, may, it is a CAR T cell of somebody, uh, somebody else that looks enough like them uh, and maybe with some alterations in the CAR T cells themselves to present up to hopefully prevent graft versus host disease. I don't know of a test case of where we've had a donor get apheresed, manufacture cells, and then given that back to their original donor, however. So um, it would be possible, but I don't know that, it, that, I've, that I've seen it done. Can donor and then derived come back to your to get to go to your second question, um, I, I think uh, DLI or donor lymphocyte infusions and CAR T cells, you know, um, DLI, uh, you know, can be used um, as a means to um, try to treat a relapse post allogenic transplant. Um, you know, I don't. There's ne they've never been head to head compared, and so it's hard to comment on the outcome. Okay, can donor derived CAR T cells seven years following an allo SCT helps severe chronic GBHD seven years post-transplant? Donor-derived CAR T cells seven, seven years, years following, following a stem cell help, transplant. Uh, so I don't know that you would, you would give CAR T cells with the pure intent um, to uh, um, to treat graft versus host disease in a person that doesn't have any evidence of uh, of active lymphoma or leukemia or what 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 the underlying disease is using, and I think that what the person asking the question is asking a, a question which may be trying to answer it in the re research realm rather than kind of what's co commercially available right now. Okay, what age group has the highest success in CAR T cell therapy? Um, well, we haven't really uh, we haven't really sorted that out because um, multiple different uh, CAR T cell constructs have looked at kind of um, differing at age. Let's say greater than or less than 60, or greater than or less than 65, um, to say that there's you know a clear cut age that says that this is the best uh, age group to get CAR T cells. I think really. Um, having the discussion as an individual that they have the right um, uh, um, organ function, they have the right disease state uh, in order to pre proceed to CAR T cells. But I personally don't think that there's an age limit to CAR T cells, an upper age limit to CAR T cells in regards to uh, um, if it's the right disease, the right patient with the right organ function and performance status. So um, I would argue we, we aren't kind of differentiating um, people by their decades of, of life in CAR T cell therapy. Okay, the next patient wants to know what's the life of a CAR T cell? I'm 80, I'm post 80 days out and I've been told mine is no longer helping. I'm also six years post all bone marrow transplant, ALL bone marrow transplant. So, so what's the, what are the CAR T cells doing if they're not working? What's, What's the life of a CAR T cell is the first part. Okay. And so, so they've been told this isn't upon, helping. So depending upon the constructs, you know, whether or not it's a CD28 or a 41DB, perhaps that can comment to the longevity of the uh, or the persistence of the CAR T cells. But with both um, kind of uh, signal or co-stimulatory molecules, you can see CAR T cells persist, you know, for a very long time. Um, if the disease has come back after CAR T cell therapy, 
It could have been that the that the antigen um, that the CAR T cells was was targeting uh, it may no longer be expressed or expressed to the degree that the CAR T cells can recognize it and gauge it, um, or the CAR T cells may have went into an exhaustive state, meaning that they just didn't have the capabilities um, because because of uh, um, you know. Uh, the CAR t the T cell and T cell features was unable to kill the the cancer cell. Um, so there's multiple reasons, you know, that we're just starting to elucidate on why CAR T cells, um, you know, people relapse after CAR T cell. Which is more effective treatment for multiple myeloma, CAR T therapy or auto transplant? That's a that's a research question that uh, you know may get answered in future clinical trials. Um, you know, CAR, uh, uh, remember, often we're using uh, CAR T cells for people with active, uh, um, very active disease, um, and in, in often in myeloma, we're using autologous transplant as a form of consolidation. So people, in the majority of the time frames, we're using. Um, autologous transplants, given the highly effective frontline therapies uh, in myeloma, we're using, you know, uh, Melflan-based autotransplants to consolidate or trying to Im improve upon, uh, um, you know, people are off, can be in stringent complete remissions and still get autotransplants, you know, where there isn't going to be significant improvement in their serologic disease and they have negative bone marrows going into it. So really, I think you're comparing apples and oranges when you ask that question. Uh, um, you know, at least in 2021, may we do in the future an auto versus CAR T cell consolidative uh, um, trial in multiple myeloma? Potentially, uh, um, that may occur. But I think we have to wait and see how my, uh, CAR T cell and myeloma uh, perform in, in kind of the post-commercial uh, setting. What are the specific reasons for not driving after transplant. I think you talked about that a little bit during this. Yeah, this was something that kind of came that kind of came um in the early days uh post CAR T cell. We we knew there was neurotoxicity and we didn't understand, you know, what was the long term neurologic effects. And I think it just kind of uh became one of those recommendations that was handed down um by the agency in an eight week time frame. I don't know that there was any, you know, clear cut data to say that eight, you know, eight weeks is safe and, and six weeks isn't, or uh, maybe we, we should go to 12 weeks. It's just been an adopted standard. I can tell you that I am one and in the post or in the pre-COVID arena, I was ready to study this question. Uh, I had a clinical trial all set and ready to go and it got COVIDed because we were gonna try and study uh, people um, and see how their driving uh, um, efficiency uh, was pre and post CAR T cell. I hope that that trial will get resurrected so I can answer that question uh, the next time I give this talk and the next time somebody asks me that question. All right, the next question is, <clears throat> I had a scary reaction to the DMSO during auto transplant. It made me severely anxious and I had trouble breathing. Is DMSO the only preservative they can use? That is a very good question, one that I've not, not been asked before, but I believe um, I believe DMSO is the only one that I, I know of, but I would discuss that with your, uh, specifically with your care team, um, if you're considering a, a CAR T cell therapy so that they could engage the manufacturer early on to see if there are, is any capability or any possibility of, uh, of um, substitution, as well as how confident uh, the care team is, is that the reaction was related to DS, uh, DMSO. So I think that those are two things that I would um, give as, as advice to that response or to that question. Myeloproliferative disorders and CAR T cell therapy. Where does this stand? Um, so uh, MPN lives on that spectrum of myeloproliferative neoplasms, uh, myelosplastic syndrome, and then acute myelogenous leukemia. So really CAR T cell needs a specific target in order to engage. I, I'm sure that there are 
researchers that are trying to go after certain targets against myeloproliferative neoplasms, but you have to remember that the uh, um, whether you know there are uh, effective therapies for myeloplastic neoplasms, and so you have to really find the right uh, risk-benefit ratio uh, to do you know therapies like CAR T cell therapy um, in certain in certain diseases. What's the mortality with CAR T cell therapy? So if you are you if you're speaking towards um, CAR people dying. Uh, related to the CAR T cell therapy and not related to the disease, um, you know that has has occurred. It has gotten better over uh, over time. Um, for instance, in the most recent uh, um, Zuma five data, which was data from follicular lymphoma, again an indolent lymphoma with people who had who had previously seen two prior lines of therapy. So again, kind of a a, a disease that that um, you know you may uh, uh, consider indolent, but it's not being indolent in this population. I believe there was one death uh, related to a grade five cytokine release uh, syndrome. Uh, there were other deaths um, early on, uh, um, you know, potentially due to neurotoxicity. So, but the but the um, vast uh, uh, if if people are dying post CAR T cell, the vast majority of the, of the reason is is due to disease coming back and not necessarily due to the CAR T cell um, causing death, but it, but it has occurred. If you have one CAR T cell therapy, can you do a second treatment? Um, yeah, so that, we kind of commented on that question a little, little bit earlier. So there is um, data uh, uh, from um, AXI cell uh, where people have received CAR uh, uh, treatment and then had a response and then had the disease come back and be retreated. Um, often, I think kind of the, the, the summary of that data is that the response may be um, equivalent in duration um, or potentially a, a little bit less. I think that if you're going to do a second CAR T cell, you should have um, that's of the same antigen, so if only engaged in CD19, you should have a plan, uh, potentially like an allo transplant to consolidate if the patient goes into a remission acceptable uh, to um, uh, to go to an allo transplant. Uh, you also could get a, uh, a, com a clinical trial uh, that may allow prior treatment with CAR T cell that may engage not only CD19, but a different antigen like CD20 or CD22. Um, uh, and in that case, you know, CAR T cells may be able to be done a second time. Would a 74-year-old man treated with CHOP in 2016 and an autologous transplant in 2019 for diffused large B cell NHI be considered for a CAR T cell therapy? He's currently undergoing bimonthly treatments of Rituxan for a planned two-year period for follicular NHL. Um, so, being that he's had two prior lines of therapy, uh, but he sounds like this individual had what I call a retrograde transformation. So, meaning that he had a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is an aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and then when it relapsed it relapsed as a follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is a matter of counting uh, um, from, from that standpoint. So um, being that he had two prior lines of, uh, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, had it come back as a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, then the patient uh, would have been eligible for CAR T cell therapy. But being that it came back as a follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or an indolent lymphoma, um, often you know, those patients can be treated uh, differently than diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, and, you know, I think that if it stays follicular lymphoma, then that individual, you know, um, and, and could get CAR T cells after two further lines uh, of having had exposed to two lines of therapy for follicular lymphoma, um, given their history. If it transforms back to large cell lymphoma, let's say it progresses, then I think you could argue that he's seen two prior lines of therapy for his large cell lymphoma and CAR T cell uh, therapy may be an option at that point. 
Good question. I mean, next, co- complicated uh, question. <laughs> question. Next question. Next question. Um, does exposure to a bispecific like blindanumab discre- decrease one's chance to a CAR-T success? So yeah, so blinitumumab uh, is is an agent that has been tested and is approved in in ALL, and um, it's a, a a drug that engages CD19, but also brings you know the native T cells. So it's a kind of a, a bispecific engager where it recruits um, CD3 uh, positive T cells uh, and engages CD19 positive uh, uh, B cells, um, and that should you know hopefully lead to um, Death of the of the tumor. I think that people who have seen prior blin exposure um, and then are are um, potential candidates for CAR T cell therapy for a- ALL, um, you know, uh, if it meets the right uh, label indication, can uh, proceed to CAR T cell with the hopes of of um, uh, efficacy. I think there is some discussion still in ALL. I don't. I'm not an ALL uh, doctor. Uh, but um, I still think there is some uh, discussion in ALL in this situation whether or not your if a response was seen post CAR T cell whether or not you would take that person to an ALL transplant if available. Can CAR T cell therapy be used for relapse of T cell PLL after CAMPATH and a stem cell transplant? So remember, it's all about the the antigen that you're attacking, right? And so these are T cells um, that that are going after a target that, that's a B cell marker. And so if you had a a CAR T cell that attacked uh, um, a T cell marker, there is a concern about this concept, which is called fratricide, uh, whereas the CAR T cells uh, are going after each other. So you have to find a unique enough target. Uh, for um, for the T cells to go after and not attack themselves um, in this situation. So really, uh, treatments for if there's cellular therapies out there for uh, TPLL, um, this would live in the clinical trial realm. Okay. This one says I was treated for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma via autologous stem cell transplant. I'm three years and three months post-transplant. I feel great, but always wonder as I progress, will I ever need a CAR T cell transplant? I am 71. I'm glad that you feel great, and I'm glad that you're in remission at three years and three months uh, post an autologous transplant for your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I think it depends upon if your lymphoma were to return. I think it depends upon what type of lymphoma uh, returns and how uh, um, how um, well you feel and how good your organs and your body is functioning at that time, um, and you make you would make that that decision if you need to, and I hope you don't need to um, in, in the future and at, and at that time. But I think that CAR T cell again, I alluded to. I'm not sure that CAR T cell has an upper age limit uh, um, to its therapy, uh, um, and I think it's you know can be part of the discussion. Great. Thank you. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, thank you, Dr. Lunning, for your very helpful remarks. And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. This was a great workshop. Yes, great question. Thank you for the, your time.